collaborative members. Hello, Quad County collaborative members, school and county department directors, leaders, and instrumental staff. Thank you for joining us for this um, from summer meals to food recovery, reaching more kids through program initiatives. First, we're gonna start off with some housekeeping rules. Okay, so if you encounter any technical difficulties, please sign off and re-enter the webinar. If the problem persists, you can use a chat box to get help. Notice how we have the chat box to get help because we're also going to have a question and answer box. And if you have questions for the speakers, please enter those in the question and answer. You can find that over to the right side and the chat is on the left side at your bottom bar. Uh, attendees are in listen only mode. So that's what you have to do. Just listen and ask your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email with the presentation. So we want to inter uh, introduce the Quad County uh, School Mills Initiative Collaborative. I think most of you know everybody here, um, you know, uh, Dr. Betty Crocker, Daisy, Andrea, Robin, uh, Robin, Gina, Andrea, Kelly, and myself, a new member. Today I'm going to moderate and we're going to go through the presentation with you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our county um, public health departments, and we're going to have four of them. Of course, we're going to have somebody from San Bernardino, Riverside, LA, and Orange County present. But we're going to start off with Kelly Warner from LA County. Thank you, Michael. My name is Kelly Warner. I am a program manager at LA County Department of Public Health in the Nutrition and Physical Activity Program. I am our county CNAP coordinator, which we call Nutrition Access LA. So just wanted to quickly highlight a couple upcoming events that we have in LA County. Both will be virtual events. On next Monday, May 16th, and. Uh, 2 to 3.30 p.m., we will have a webinar called Good for Students, Good for Schools, How CalFresh Promotion Will Move Districts Forward. If this sounds familiar, the lovely team from No Kid Hungry has been supporting all of our counties to do a webinar promoting CalFresh in schools. So we hope if you're in LA County, you can join us. Um, and then we also will have a, another webinar I wanted to highlight on Thursday, May 19th, a lunchtime webinar from 12 to 1.15. This is um, hosted by the California Conference of Local Health Department Nutritionists, CCLHDN, if you're familiar with the organization. This one's titled Improving Nutrition Security in Los Angeles County from Assessment to Implementation, and will feature my program director, Deepa Shah Patel. Um, really looking forward to that one. If you are a dietitian, you get a free CEU for attending, but it is open to everyone. So the links to register are here and I can put them in the chat as well. My email and, and office phone are listed on the slide as well. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in joining our uh, meetings or getting uh, on the listserv for Nutrition Access LA. And with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Robin Ronkis, the CNAP coordinator for San Bernardino County. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Um, next Wednesday, May 18th from 9.30 to 11.30, we're having our general CNAP meeting. We're theming it what's cooking in San Bernardino County and focusing on many uh, cooking and culinary experts and resources. In addition, um, one of the main focuses of our, of our county is helping to plan for summer meals. So if there are any school districts that would need uh, support uh, for summer meals, let me know. We can um, uh, partner with many community organizations for enrichment activities to help you also promote your programs. I will put my information in the chat box as well as information on our general CNAP meeting that's coming up. Okay, next is uh, Gina Osborne, my counterpart in Orange County. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gina Osborne, and I'm a supervising public health nutritionist here at the Orange County Healthcare Agency for the CalFresh Healthy Living Program. And a couple updates um, from Orange County. Um, we're also partnering, uh, partnering with No Kid Hungry and the Orange County Department of Ed to host a um, 
the same webinar that Kelly mentioned in LA, good, good for students, good for schools, how CalFresh promotion will move districts forward. And our webinar will be on May 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. And the registration link is, is here on the screen. So if you are in Orange County, we invite you to join us um, next week on May 19th. Um, the other update I have is that um, we just finished our first food waste prevention month um, in April here in Orange County. And with that, our, um, our group uh, developed a social media guide with different posts for our partners to um, help promote food waste prevention, tips to reduce food waste. And we also hosted several events throughout Orange County. And so we plan to make this an annual event um, in, in our county. And then lastly, um, we uh, one, another update I have is our Orange County Social Services Agency did develop a CalFresh communication toolkit. And this is geared towards um, families with um, K through 12 students and it's to help promote um, CalFresh to those families that are eligible. And so with that, um, I will also put my contact information in the um, chat box. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my counterpart in Riverside, Andrea. Andrea actually uh, was not gonna be able to make it today. So uh, we just wanted to give this announcement for her that her next CNAP meeting is going to be August 4th at 10 a.m. Um, and if you have any questions, to please email her uh, to join her mailing list. Thank you. And next slide, Tommy. Well, perfect. Thank you, uh, county members. Uh, if you don't know, I'm um, the director of nutrition services at Fullerton School District, and I work with our county department. And I'll let you know, Gina and uh, Robin and everybody has been fabulous to work with. And if you need any assistance, they are there to help you out. Now we're gonna move on to school nutrition policy updates with the famous Dr. Betty Crocker. Thank you for joining us, Betty. <laughs> Mr. Burns, you are you are far too kind, friend. It's a, it's a pleasure to share the stage with you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Um, next slide, please, uh, Tommy. So uh, as I uh, shared last time we met, uh, this is a smoking white, hot, beautiful uh, time to be in school nutrition. And uh, there's a lot of fluid uh, change and opportunities. And so what I did is I made a compilation uh, starting at the national state, and then I'm going to get into the regional, and I'm going to give you a lot more information uh, from the state level. So in the policy corner, starting at the national, um, the school nutrition associations, it's very important to know, of course, that our USDA waivers that have carried us through um, the pandemic and through current day are ending on June 30th. The caveat to that end is that if your school year officially ends like me, I end on June 9th, the waivers end for me on June 9th. So when I wake up on June 10th, it's a different day. I may not use those waivers anymore. There's no more parent pickup in the area eligibility and much has been impacted as I know all of the directors um, are familiar with. The other thing is, our big uh, federal bill right now that we're all watching, and I just uh, I logged on just moments before I uh, sat here for this webinar, is we still have no movement on this. Uh, the Support Kids Not Red Tape Act of 2022. This is a uh, bipartisan approach to extend the USDA waivers. This is the one that we are all uh, watching at present. I always recommend getting up on the School Nutrition Association or the SNA. Uh, action alerts because that's a really great way to stay connected. The annual conference is coming up. Um, I just looked up that date for us as well. I hope uh, to see you all in Orlando. The early bird uh, special ends May 21st, so make sure that you are enrolled. And I put the website uh, at the very bottom bullet, schoolnutrition.org. At the state level, of course, uh, California School Nutrition Association, uh, there is a lot of action as well. We are the first state in our um, country to provide universal meals uh, as a permanent feature for every school day. So that means uh, the state meal mandate is going to include breakfast and lunch. The big question is when? The answer is when your school year starts. So for the summer, the meal mandate does not uh, mean that you have to serve breakfast and lunch. The meal mandate for summer is still uh, just lunch. 
The state meal mandate um, in summer school, again, I, I put on there is only lunch. Now, the other big thing uh, for many of us, um, the kit funding, the kitchen infrastructure uh, training funding. I hope that you uh, signed on for that webinar that CDE just flew. And I'm as soon as it's posted, if you haven't, I highly recommend if you've received the kit funding to get on there. The biggest thing that I took away from that is that the um, you can deposit those monies in the general fund to provide flexibility so anything that the general fund can spend money on your kit fund can spend money on the other big take home that i got from the cde presentation is that we can look back to all of our expenses through july 9th of 2021 and put those within the kit funding uh, on the regional uh, level southern california school nutrition association uh, the chapter one meeting, it's a it, it's, it's just a terrific way to connect with all of us locals. On May 20th, we are meeting at 8 a.m. in uh, the beautiful city of Arcadia, Le Meridian. I have never been there yet. Look forward to uh, seeing everybody there. Uh, our special guest uh, for that day is um, a representative, Judy Chu. Uh, I currently uh, have the pleasure of serving as your policy chair for the Southern California School Nutrition and I'm actively recruiting for co-chair. Yet uh, somebody accepted today, it's not uh, OFISH public yet, but uh, I look forward to announcing that to you soon. And there's there's the website, uh, Eat Smart to Be Smart. I know that's a lot of information for one slide, so please forgive me, but Tommy, could you hit that next slide button for me? Um, California May Revise. Again, I looked uh, on the website, the California May Revise has not yet posted we're expecting this on Thursday or Friday here's the big deal to be us they're significantly higher revenue numbers than initially projected in the January budget which means that there's going to be some wonderful opportunities for schools both houses of the legislature uh, recently released their budget priorities which each including a significant increase in discretionary funding for who for us for schools the Senate proposal includes an additional five billion in funding for the LCFF on top of the expected 6.5 statutory COLA, which the assembly is proposing a 15% COLA. Um, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be us. So let's see what they have to say. Next slide, please, Tommy. Staying uh, now with a uh, CDE. I wanted to uh, get some save the dates uh, for you. CDE is uh, obviously pretty busy helping us all out. On the 17th, um, we have the listening sessions for the universal mail. On the 24th, um, the CDE will have another school nutrition town hall to include a uh, policy guidance and sharing of best practices for all of our operation and for the universal mails. I put the email up there for you. Next slide, please, Tommy. And the very last um, slide is, although the USDA waivers are ending, all of our colleagues at the CDE asked the USDA, I think it was for a total number of nine waivers is what uh, Kim was telling us, the director for the CDE and of those, um, her and her team were able to get three approved. Uh, you have um, all of the directors have received emails on this from the CDE, but just uh, some uh, simple tips here. The first one is the first first site visit has been waived. Interesting uh, for SFSP, which uh, we are over here at Redlands, uh, and this is not the case for SSO. Closed enrolled site area eligibility that is a big one for folks that are not 100% CEP. Over at Redlands, we are 100% CEP. So um, here you can use the census data to extrapolate your area eligibility. And then the mealtime restrictions. This was the most interesting one to me uh, with all of the very fluid nature of our uh, school, uh, summer school sites is that we can serve breakfast and lunch um, without consideration of how much time needs to lapse between um, the two of those. Of course, you're gonna report all of that in CNIP, so of what your mealtime service is. Out of all three of these, you do not have to opt in on any of these. Previously, you recall, we had to opt in for just about everything. So on these, they're granting us all of these. And Tommy, the very next slide, please. There we go. There's your policy update. Um, my uh, website right there, rusdnutrition.org. You can grab me or any of the, what I call the uh, Child Nutrition Services Dream Team. Hope you all are having a great day. Uh, I'm over and out, heading it back to Mr. Burns. Woo. All right, Betty, I love your Cheerios because you're always so <laughs> cheerful. And you get some fruit with that too. 
Oh some, yeah. Some, hey now. Betty, hey now. Some um, Betty Cheerfuls. <laughs> Thank you, Bless Betty, you very much. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to go into poll questions. All right, Tommy, you ready for the first question to throw it out there for everybody? See what we can uh, see what we can gather. All right. The first question, number one, summer meals. All right. Compared with your pre-COVID service, your summer meal programs for 2022 will be, will like be, and then you have some questions. All right, looks like we are slowing down on the number of people um, submitting. We got a pretty good amount. All right, so we are very close. Um, I've, I've never done this before, so I'm going to end the poll right now and we're going to see what the responses are. Okay, so 30% uh, of you are going to are expanding. We have 30% the same as our pre-COVID summer service, and we have 39% smaller, fewer sites. All right. And, oh, here, share results. Okay. All right, our next question, question number two. As a summer sponsor, we would like assistance with, and check all that apply. All right, looks like the, we're gonna close the poll now and we are going to share results. All right, so we see here 37% uh, would like help with marketing promotion and 21% would like scheduling enrichment activities. 42% would like grant funding for summer programming. 28% would like assistance navigating waivers. We have 21% would like help with kickoff event planning and 35% is not applicable. Again, you can always go to your uh, county health department and contact one of the four and they will definitely be willing to assist. And also no kids hungry, Don't let's not forget about them. All right, so now we're gonna move on. This kind of primed you for our presentation by Don Soto. She's gonna talk about what they're gonna do at LA County for their summer food service program. Don, it is all yours. Thank you, Michael. And I wanna thank No Kid Hungry California. I wanna thank all of you for the fantastic things you guys are doing year in, year out, and including leading up to summer. As we know, hunger does not end when the school year ends. It continues during summer. And we at Cafe LA, well, we'd like to think that we're a great part of our students' day throughout the entire year. And so we've got a lot of exciting things coming up. I wanna share a little bit of that with you. As you can see, we have children that love to eat our food. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we do have a mascot, that little dude over there in that corner. That's Cafe LA Ray. And we like to take him out with us during summer as we do a lot of kickoff events and media events to raise some awareness on all of the fantastic things we have starting this summer. Tell me if you can click to the next slide for me. Thank you. So, uh, fun fact with us, we um, 
actually had two in 2019, 350 sites open. Tommy, if you can click that, I have some animation. And you can see we did a phenomenal amount of numbers. And those numbers are what we serve each and every day in our summer program. Well, in 2020, we are going to amp up our program. And we're going to go from 350 sites pre-COVID to 569 sites. These sites are going to offer instructional and supervisory programs for the children that attend our schools that are in need of some assistance during the summer. And that's fantastic because it gives us a great opportunity to do a lot of outreach out there. We're going to take advantage of our breakfast program. We're going to run our breakfast program as a closed campus with the approval of the CDE. Now, why do we need a closed breakfast campus? Well, because our schools you know, are in some areas where security is of the utmost importance and some of our administration feels better having a closed campus. So we're taking advantage of that opportunity. But our lunch is gonna be open, not just to our participants of our programs, to our communities in whole. We're so excited and we know that our meal counts are going to just escalate with that. And as you can see, there's a sample of just our community outreach. And that's one of our banners that we post facing the community so everybody can see that we have tasty, delicious, nutritious meals available for them to participate. Tommy, if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Now, I love a waiver. You love a waiver. We all love a waiver. And I'll tell you why I love waivers. Because... COVID has given a lot of leeway, and I'm pretty sure just like you, you're going to struggle immensely with re-educating our parents and our children not to do what? Take food off the campus. So that's going to be a transition that we have, and it also helps us with not having to monitor the gates so much during those serving periods. Um, Tommy, if you could hit the next slide, please. Thank you so much. All right, now. What makes us unique and different, and what I would like you guys to explore is becoming a vendor for some of your organizations in your communities. Cafe LA has entered in for the eighth year in a row, a contract with the city of Los Angeles uh, Parks and Recs program. In 2021, we ran 104 parks that provided over 200,000 lunch meals. We do charge them for those because we are their vendor. And you wanna make sure when you enter in the contracts that it's gonna cover your overhead costs. We charged a $3.91 set per meal. That's kind of like a sweetheart deal with city of LA, which is uh, about six cents lower than their reimbursement rate. But something changed over time. And that was costs have increased. And I'm sure you're all feeling that pinch just as much as us. So in 2022, we're gonna be supplying 102 parks with the exact same meals that we are serving to our children on our campus. And we actually pack them, we prepare them, and we ship them in our employees' cars and we deliver them to the parks where that park staff will serve and distribute our meals to their program. They are the school food authority uh, or program authority over their programs. So we don't have to deal with any monitoring of any paperwork other than food transport records. And you're gonna notice a difference between the cost of 2021 to 2022. We are charging them $4.76 per meal to um, cover all of our costs. And um, if you're familiar with the SFSP training, they do give a, a, a program reminder. You could consider using a school food authority to prepare meals and purchase them from you. So if you're looking at a way of thinking outside the box, providing with extra income for your program, consider being a vendor of a park, of a local church, a childcare center that's gonna start their own program. The added bonus for us is because we have a lot of employees and they don't work traditionally during the summer. So when we enter into a vendor contract, it allows us to give more employment opportunities to our employees. Tommy, next slide. I would like to encourage you guys to take advantage of some partnerships that you already probably have within your organization. And for us, we have some fantastic folks with our after-school program. 
That allows us to reach out to LA's Best, Beyond the Bell, which are grant funded or district funded programs. Now this beautiful partnership allows us not to have to do all the heavy lifting of serving and supervising the children. So our after school program participants working in the summer help us along with that path as well. Tommy, our next slide. All right. If you are going to have any programs during your summer, obviously you want to have some activities. Activities are a great way of getting children to go into campuses and participate in your meal program, as well as maybe learning some instructional information, some uh, physical activity, and how about, yes, nutrition education as well. Our LA's Best After School program is going to hold a taste and teach program at 128 of our sites. Now that's not all of our programs because again, we have summer school, um, after school uh, summer supervision, but also the educational per component of that. Taste and teach is going to have activities every day of the week. Now, June is National Dairy Month. And because it's National Dairy Month, we reached out to our partners at the Dairy Council of California to partner with us. As you can see the little pictures there, those are some samples of the information. They'll give it to you free at no charge. And if you reach out to them for technical assistance, they just might step in and help you run a program at one of your um, organizations. Our Taste and Teach and LA's Best is also going to provide STEM and physical activities. Now, one of the fun activities that they're gonna do is they're gonna actually make ice cream in a bath. Now, where are they gonna get ice? Where are they gonna get milk? Well, you can also reach out to your after-school program or your summer programs, and they can help you. Um, you can help them by purchasing items. So we're gonna order the milk by the courts. We're gonna order the ice we bill them for those items as that is not reimbursable for us. But the bonus of that is we can help them store that stuff. They're not bringing outside food into our refrigerators and freezers. We've purchased it locally sourced and then um, contracted vendors and we can store that for them. So it's a really great opportunity for you to partner together with them. Tanya, next slide. Now our summer menus are so delicious. Now we have amped it up. Traditionally, we offer one entree. This year, we're gonna offer two entrees. We have an increase of our leafy green selection. We have delicious salads and sandwiches, and we're really gonna focus on the bounty that summer brings us with our fresh fruit options. Now, we are a Meet This Monday organization, as well as I know some of you guys are as well. So I thank you guys for continuing those, those efforts. Now, this food is delicious, but we've got to get the reach out there. So how do we get them to be aware of what is going on in your area? Well, you want to have some kickoff events. And our kickoff events are always a fun event. We get kids involved. We get parents involved. When we really want to bring in is the media. So we get Cafe LA Ray, our mascot out there. He's helping serve up meals. He's building up camaraderie. It's great for a photo op. We always have our superintendent join us at our kickoff event. And we're very fortunate that we do receive uh, media visits from Univision, Telemundo, KTLA, and LAUSD has its very own uh, radio state, television station, and that's KLCS. So we have a lot of partners. Reach out to your local media organizations and showcase the fantastic jobs that you guys are doing out there. Tommy, if you can hit my next slide, please. All right. So. As you are probably all doing, we are so happy to provide all different classes of vegetables. We do adhere to USDA sugar and calorie limits. We have low sodium menus, no trans fat. We are a whole grain enriched pro program. And with that, well, delicious bounty can come in the form of spices. You can enhance the flavor of your food and it's just a really great program that you guys can run. I hope you guys think outside the box. Um, shameless plug, if you're going to be out at ANC in July, swing by one of my two sessions and say hello. I'd love to meet you guys. Um, and I hope you guys have a great summer. And Michael, I pass that off to you. Ooh. All right, thank you, Don. Hey, you did a great job. 
all those meals sound so delicious and, and you know making healthy and you know, all extra vegetables and stuff like that i don't know if the low salt sounded uh, so appetizing but it all sounded delicious and hey when you make that ice cream give me a call i want to come on down all right next we have ksenia glenn she's going to talk about um increasing isp for cep thank you uh ksenia and, and ksenia by the way is the director of upland unified hello everybody good afternoon it is an honor and my joy to be here and share the space with you um this is uh by no means an expert opinion but my hope is that as we share the story with you that it helps you too so for the past two years, we did not have to collect applications. Next year, a lot of us go into CEP and um, most of our schools won't be collecting applications, right? So um, the school district still has to have the data on free, reduced and paid status. Um, so naturally they came to us as experts of collecting this data. And I have to say, um, I really didn't know how to tackle this from the LCFF form standpoint. So um, I just uh, started to brainstorm with my team and we created a unduplicated pupil count team. Next slide, please. This is just some vocab for you guys. This is mostly just uh, when we share this presentation, but as I talk about UPC and ISP um, with directly certified English learners, you'll know what I'm talking about. Next slide, please. A little bit about Upland, we're in San Bernardino County, technically right on the border of LA County. We have 10,000 students, 14 sites. Oh, so we went from 56% um, and duplicate people count to 58% in 2020 to 68% in 2021. So you could see the 10% jump from last year to this year. Um, really, it, it's, it's a testament of our teamwork and we're in San Bernardino County. Next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about three things, data and how we get it, team and how we built it, and process and how we created it. Next slide, please. So data. First step was just to see where is all of our data coming from. It's coming from our DCs, right? Your SNAPs and your Medi-Cals, um, your extended DCs. This is going through and making sure the addresses match um, for really it was a manual process for us. Um, uh, EL students, paper, paper education benefit form, we call it that way, it's LCFF form. We also have electronic LCFF form. Then we have student information system, ARES is an our case. And through that, we do a parent, parent data confirmation. Essentially, it's electronic way to get the free reduced paid information. And also our McKinney Vento kit as well. So this is everywhere that we get the data from. Next slide, please. This is our LCFF form. It has a QR code and it has also a direct link to where you can um, fill it out. We promote it on social media, on the websites, through phone calls, uh, through paper copies as a last resort. Mostly it was electronic copies. Next slide, please. And um, this is just Boba Fett. You can only get so far without a tribe. So let's talk about who's on our team. These are all the people that we identified on our team. In red, these are our core, core folks. So you have Director of Student Information System, Aries in our, in our case, Data Management Specialist. This is your CalPADS person, identify who that is. Director of IT Department, Nutrition Services Account Specialist. These are your folks that will be, um, you know, making sure the DCs are correct and uh, downloading and, and going through data. Director of Fiscal Services, um, he is the one that's going to be really driving and pushing us to get more data because it results in a lot of money above the base grant. We have Director of Support Services. This is our McKinnon Vento contact. We have Assistant uh, Superintendent of Business Services. This is my boss and Nutrition Services Director. This was our core team that we identified that was meeting again and again and again with so many uh, meetings to make sure that we're on track. And the little blue guys are as important, but this is your tertiary circle, right? This is your people at sites. They're as important. 14 principals. We have five secretaries. We have IT techs. Uh, we have uh, 
sub clerks, director of communication, she's the one pushing that information to our parents, office managers, these are your lifesavers, and I'll talk about um, why, and other people. <laughs> and of course, there's accountable versus responsible, right? So all of us are responsible, but ultimately my boss, Terry, is the responsible, uh, I'm sorry, the accountable person that will be uh, getting all this information to the board. Next slide, please. Okay, we also built a timeline. Realistically, what do we do? So from July to April, this is when we do monthly DCs, right? We download as much information as possible through our CalPads and doing those extended DCs every single month. Then in April, this is when we do a data pool, final data pool, and we extend the DC as well. April through May is when our school funding team meets. Also, every May um, and to, through June, I connect with every single principal. I have either eyeball time with them or I call them on the phone and I just go through the whole process. Hey, I remember how last year we did this? We um, distribute this form. This is what it looks like. This is what how important it is. This is the biggest fundraiser you can have at the school. So just have that face time with each principal so they know this is important and this is happening again every year. During the summer, we have those CEP deadlines. Uh, our team meets yet again. The rollover happens and we post those LCFF forms online. Uh, during August, this is when our school starts. So we start to do a little competition with our office managers through ARIES, our information, student information system. This is where we drive um, our competition with all the different schools and to get as much those parent data confirmations as possible, PDC. So office managers are provided a list of how many students have completed the uh, confirmation process and through that confirmation process is, is where they complete the online LCFF forms. You can notice that team meets again and we collect forms electronically as well. So really just like every possible way we can get that. And in October, of course, we have the deadline. Um, uh, by about mid-October, when we realize, okay, we have done parent data confirmation, we as much as possible, try to do electronic and physical form collection. What do we do now? We still have a list of, of students that gave us no data at all, meaning they didn't turn in electronic, no physical form. We just don't have data. They're not on DC list, right? They're just, um, they don't have any data. So at that point, we do something uh, a little crazy and we set up a phone call. It literally looks like a little marketing center. We hire part-time staff. And this is going to be our um, calling center where we have people call every single parent that has no data on file and fills out the form with them on the phone right then and there. So this is, uh, it takes about two to three minutes per phone call. Uh, we do Spanish speaking um, as well. So we just try to capture as much as possible. And we have a little spreadsheet that I'm, I'm totally gonna share with you guys where we put in students who did receive, where we did receive the data and it removes them from no data list. So basically the list of no data gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then after the October 31st deadline, we recap, we do a self audit as well. We recap to see how could have, what could we do a little um, better next year? For example, last year we didn't connect with our McKinnon-Vento um, team until later on in the game. And there are some discrepancies of how many, um, you know, homeless uh, status students do we really have? It was really um, confusing actually. So next year, like, okay, we're gonna connect with them a lot earlier in the year. So doing that self audit and recap process is very important because um, the self audit, for example, we literally take random applications and um, or LCFF forms and we just data trace them. You know, what did this person, answer is this student really enrolled are they active you know just going through every single avenue to make sure this is a legit data piece next slide please okay um now to the process what how do we do this how do we stay organized at first it was just a simple little google doc and it was very difficult to assign tasks so we implemented the racy uh, system 
If you're not familiar with RACI, this is a responsible, accountable consultant in the form format. Next slide, please. What it looked like is a very boring looking, but super useful spreadsheet. It literally has every single task that we could possibly think of. This is just a little snapshot. The actual document is pages long. Whatever we could think of that needs to be done, and we put it on there, we put a personal responsible on there, I erased it just for this purpose, all the due dates and status, right? This is from last year, so everything is complete, but I'll show you guys, I think there's a, the current year too. Yeah, so here's another one. As you can see here, not only did we put um, actual tasks, we also put queries. For example, if we wanted to do a query for extended benefits from education benefits from data, uh, or provide a list of students with no data by site, we put that query in our actual spreadsheet. So there's no question for next year, like, hey, how do we do this? These queries take a long time to figure out. And um, those of you who work with Aries, sometimes it's challenging, especially during certain uh, year, time of the year to get um, help right away. So recording it so you're not doing double work for next year was so key for us to just, um, have a uh, pocket somewhere. Uh, next slide, please. This is our self audit. We were kind of freaking out because we went from 58% to 68. We're like, um, okay, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of money. Uh, that's millions of dollars in difference. And um, is this really correct? So we basically went back to 2018, 2020 and see what did we do differently this year? And really, we saw that our parent data confirmation, this is the, uh, the LCFF form through ARIES portal piece, was really key for us. Um, also, you know, extended DC and DC, those kind of like we, those are pretty much very similar, but uh, what we really pushed is that parent data confirmation. So we kind of just for our comfort saw like, okay, at least we know where it's coming from and it makes sense because we did a really huge push on that. Okay, and next slide, please. And then finally, we recap and plan. So now we just transfer a doc over from last year to this year, and we add, um, you know, maybe more details. Uh, we actually didn't figure out this way until like late September last year. So we're missing like the beginning of school year. So now as we plan for next year, we add more tasks for the entire school year. And again, we put in important dates at the very top, uh, what are the tasks and who is responsible? What are due dates and the status? Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Here's my email address. Please feel free to email me. Um, I would love to, I remember how scary it was for me to just get this, get my mind around this, especially for new directors. So please reach out to me and I'm totally available to discuss anything with you. Thank you so much. Wow, so much information and th so thorough. Ksenia did a great job. And I love the fact that you brought up the Boba Fett because it's so true. You can only do what, uh, you know, go so far without your team, right? May the force be with you and everybody else. Thank you. All right, now it is a five minute break. So let's see what time it is right now. It is uh, 2.46. So we will take our five minute break and resume back at 251 and did some stretching or uh, some other type of activity or get yourself a drink of water. But now we have a special announcement. One of our uh, special guests has been honored with an award. Congratulations to Daniel Capello. He's a nutrition services director at, um, at Desert Sands Unified School District. And he has been, uh, he has received the Classified Administrator of the Year for Riverside County. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and then now uh, uh, Daniel, not only received this recognition, but now he's going to present to us uh, his, uh, what is that, uh, game changing through um, a food recovery and how he uh, uh, um, composts or goes through his, uh, his trash. <laughs> I guess I'm talking trash today. First of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, for allowing me to speak. I'm happy to talk to all of you. Obviously, this is an extremely uh, complicated topic. 
This is generally meant to just be a quick overview. Um, and before I get into that, um, Desert Sands is a district of approximately 27,000 students. Prior to COVID, we had about a 70% free and reduced rate. Uh, we have 33 schools and many other ancillary programs that go on here. Next slide. Um, so this is some uh, statistics on food waste. Food waste is the single largest component of municipal waste in the United States. Statistics say over 40% of unneeded edible food ends up in landfills. So one of the things about Desert Sands and probably at your school sites as well is this becomes a very big frustration, not only for the custodians and the staff, but the students that are witnessing this great amount of wasted food on a daily basis. Wasted food in the United States is responsible for over 135 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions each year. And one of the statistics I found in preparing for this was that school kitchens are one of the largest producers of food waste. USDA meal patterns obviously add significant landfill waste with mandatory servings of fruits and vegetables. And I think you're most of you are probably in agreement. I think it's wonderful that we have um, that we have a meal pattern that allows children to have great volumes of fruits and vegetables, uh, but much of it just goes to waste. They're walking out the front door, they're throwing it in. We're trying to make it palatable to find the things that they're most interested in or most attractive, but forcing them leads to a lot of waste. And that's an unfortunate, un unfortunate side effect of all of this. And the USDA estimates one in 10 US homes experience food insecurity in 2020. And for all of you that have done curbside throughout COVID, um, you realize just how necessary we are uh, keeping children um, fed during these very, very difficult times. Um, we're certainly uh, definitely needed in our society today. There's a great deal of need. Next slide. So beginning in January 22, SB 1383 establishes statewide targets to reduce the amount of organic waste disposed in landfills. 50% reduction by 2020 and 75% reduction of food waste by 2025. It also sets a goal to rescue at least 20% of currently disposed edible food by 2025 and redirect that food to people in need. Next slide. Businesses are required to track and maintain records of recovered and recycled foods. Um, the things that we wanna make sure that we're tracking. Um, you have to have a contract, we'll talk about that in just a sec, with one or more food banks or donation sites. Um, you have to keep track of schedules for your donations. You have to keep track of the quantity in pounds by the month. And you also have to keep track of types of food that you're donating, uh, edible food that's donated to a food bank or pantry. A contract or, men, or MOU should be crafted, it needs to be crafted between LEAs and local food recovery agencies. calrecycle.ca.gov has a sample contract that covers all the bases. And Desert Sands began a pilot program in 2021 at a local middle school for edible food collection. So I was contacted probably about November by a student in the eighth grade who uh, was concerned about uh, food waste. Um, I had a meeting with him. Um, we sort of set some boundaries. It was actually a project he was working for uh, in an international baccalaureate uh, program at his eighth grade school. But I was blown away at what an absolutely outstanding job he did collecting food. And we're going to be rolling out his program at more schools next year. Next slide. And now I'd like to show you that video. Yeah, I get it. But at least it says apples and bananas. Well, I hate them both. Wait, do you really think that's the right thing to do? Let's elaborate on that. My name is Trinity Patterson. Many people around the world suffer with starvation, and one of those many places is here, the Coachella Valley. 
A lot of us believe that we do everything that we can to prevent this. And it's true, we do do a lot. But there is a lot of things that we can also work on. And one of those things is how we use our food. Let's think of that scenario that was shown on screen a couple of seconds ago. You saw a student who had an apple and he did not want to eat it. So he threw it away. While you might think that doesn't do a lot, but really it causes a big impact on people who don't have the food increase and how we are planning to accomplish this project. <laughs> All right. Well, um, one thing that I, um, as he cut off, one thing that he didn't explain um, throughout this project, well, two things really. Number one, it was very interesting to see how it was a far easier for him to get buy-in from other stakeholders at our school sites. So anytime he ran this project 100% himself, I made, he talked to noon duty aides, he talked to the security guards at his school to make sure that if he wasn't able to watch the food as it was being collected, that it was still being monitored. Because from the minute we first connected, I was extremely concerned about food tampering, especially on an eighth grade campus. But it's been remarkably um, successful. Currently, he has collected since January over one and a half tons of food. So we're going to use this as a model next year um, we're going to start with volunteers so that we, because we do need to take up a little bit of their walk-in space, which at Desert Sands is obvious. It's probably like most of you, our walk-in space is at a real premium. The other thing that he didn't um, explain is that that $25 gift card, we have been doing a lot of work with local farms and farm to school, COVID and the waivers and just the amount of time that we have to spend on alternate projects really allowed us to implement a farm to school program. So we had a farmer's market at his school. And one of the conditions for me with him was to do this project was that I wanted him to teach a class on offer versus serve. So he went through the meal patterns, explained to every student at his school what a reimbursable meal was, what they needed to take and what they did not need to take. And then those students were, uh, were entered into a, um, a raffle to win the $25 Barnes and Noble card. So because uh, honestly, I believe that food waste is gonna start you know, inside the cafeteria. It's gonna be a lot easier to try to prevent food waste inside the walls of our buildings than outside trying to keep it from going into the trash cans. Like I said, this was very quick. I, um, and honestly, this class would probably take two hours. All of you, I'm sure, are testing the waters right now, trying to understand even our own trash. Even our own trash company is having difficulty managing this. We weren't able to get any resources for them. Um, in, in preparing for this, two uh, resources that I think were extremely invaluable is calrecycle.ca.gov. A lot, a lot of information. You could spend hours going through it. And then the other thing is um, www.reduceweight.scgov.org. And that's Santa Clara Recycling, which is also another great uh, resource for all of you. So thank you very much. John, so inspirational. Thank you. <laughs> you and that boy and John Glenn Middle School, that video. Man, I can see why you've collected 1.5 tons worth of uh, hey, produce. Yeah, listen, I just, before I sign off, I just want to be clear. This kid collected, I did, a, I helped a little, he did all of it. And the second piece, he's really shown us the five degrees of separation are really two or three in a school district because working with him and finding, you know, he wanted to do a food pantry. We're already working with a food pantry. That food pantry has a food pantry at one of our school sites. So we're gonna be working with this small, this teacher's program at a school site to get her some funding so that she can get sinks, refrigerators, sanitary, um, you know, the sinks and things to keep things clean. It's just been a remarkable experience. Uh, I'm very happy it turned out. The other piece to this is um, he certainly is a better public speaker than I am. <laughs> well, Desert Sands and yourself are very proud of him. I'm sure so is his parents and the, his school. 
Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. All right. So now we have uh, Daisy uh, Munguilla Pinon. She is going to be presenting and updating us on No Kids Hungry updates. Thank you, Michael. All right. Next slide, Tommy, please. So I wanted to share that at No Kids Hungry, we have several summer meal resources for you. Um, they're all on our website on the Center for Best Practices. You can find a resource on communicating to your families about the changes of summer meals, um, understanding COVID waivers, um, marketing toolkits. We would have a toolkit to engage your local mayor. Um, in our resources and toolkits, you'll find social media posts, graphics for banners, um, flyers. And you can take any of our material and make it your own. So I encourage you to check out our resources. You find a graphic, save it to your computer, add your district logo, take a, a media post, use it as this or change the language up, make it your own. But we definitely have almost anything you can think of. And if there's something that you can't find on our website, reach out to us and we'll look for it or we'll help you create it. Next slide. We also have a lot of upcoming events. Um, here are a few webinars. And in addition, I wanted to remind everybody that our texting hotline has changed. And the new number is text food or comida to 304-304. And the way that we get our data is we get it from CDE. So some of our sponsors upload their information, communicate to CDE, and then CDE on a weekly basis provides the updates to USDA. And that's how we then incorporate that data into our texting hotline. So um, make sure you keep CD updated. That's how we get our data for the texting hotline. Um, but if you do have a change, there could be maybe one to two week lag um, before the information gets updated into our system. So here are a few pictures of all the cool posters and graphics we have. Um, we have a summer meals webinar coming up. We have CalFresh webinars, and we have a CEP workgroup meeting on May 25th. Next slide, please. We also have so many ways we can help you, um, and we wanna help. To begin with, let's talk kickoff events. Um, we're really encouraging districts to have kickoff events. We also understand the issue of the capacity, with time, and here at Nothing Hungry, you can see us as an extra pair of hands and we'll help you plan your, your kickoff. We can help you market your kickoff. We can exhibit, we can drop off swag for you to give out to your parents. So um, let us know, uh, we're here to help. Just shoot us an email. Um, we think that kickoffs is a great way to get parents back into the routine of, of going there with their children, visiting the sites, eating there, taking place of activities and just getting back to the idea of how summer used to be like uh, a few years ago. We can also help you with marketing. Um, we have the templates um, that you can use, but we also have digital strategies. So we can do marketing on like Facebook online based on zip codes and do target, targeted outreach based on your summer meal sites and your zip codes. So if you're interested in digital strategies to market, also reach out to us and again, all of this is at no cost to you. It's all free. We also still have summer grants. I saw in the poll that grant funding was needed and we have grants. Our last deadline for this fiscal year is May 31st. And these grants can be used for marketing, equipment, for capacity, um, even for staff morale. We understand we're tired, we've been working nonstop, you need t-shirts, you need something to, to incentivize your staff to work for the summer, our grants can be used for that function. So again, reach out to one of, somebody from No Kid Hungry, email us at nokidhungrycalifornia at strength.org, and we can help you, you know, give you the RFP and, and set you up to apply. But the last deadline is May 31st. And again, um, as a reminder, we, we're here at, at no cost support and we can provide technical assistance we have Robin Hernandez, our great school access manager. She has so much experience with summer meals planning and kickoff. And even if you just want to reach out to us to bounce ideas off, you know, I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of that. 
reach out to us. We're really here to help in any capacity and explore any crazy ideas you have for some. Um, and lastly, uh, again, visit our center for best practices. We have so many resources on summer and much more. Next slide. So fresh off the presses, we have just completed a summer 2022 area eligibility analysis. Um, we went ahead and we looked at all the number of sites that were open in 2021. And we have the data for the entire state, but I just wanted to just focus on the counties that are part of the QCC. And based on census data and school boundary data, we did an analysis of how many sites are unlikely to be uneligible now because the waivers were gone. We also looked at the number of kids that possibly will be without access. So um, you can see the numbers for LA, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino. In the state of California overall, um, there were 5,469 open sites in 2021, but now with the waiver being discontinued, 1,024 of these sites are likely are likely to be uneligible to surf meals. So um, we wanted to do this analysis to kind of figure out and identify any gaps there are um, within the counties throughout the state and to show the impact that waivers had. Um, we also have the data um, available by sponsor. If you're interested in taking a deeper dive, feel free to reach out to somebody from No Good Hungry and um, we can get you connected with, with the spreadsheet. So just wanted to share that. Next slide. And lastly, I wanted to highlight this amazing CalFresh social media toolkit that um, Tom and our very own Tommy took the lead on. And we have graphics and social media posts and 13 different languages for CalFresh. So, we really want to think of schools and what the role is in CalFresh outreach, and we're trying to make it as easy as possible. So um, I encourage you to explore this new toolkit that we have. Community partners, school districts, charter schools, anybody can use it. We have um, assets available in over 13 languages. Again, you can click on the link, download and save the, and save the graphic on your computer desktop, and then you're set to go. So. Those were all my no good hungry updates for this QCC. I'll pass it back to you, Michael. Thank you, Daisy. Some great information. Hey, Daisy and No Kids Hungry and that team over there, they have really been instrumental in helping uh, schools um, with marketing. I know they've helped me with marketing, social media. They've helped me with grants. Uh, and if you haven't reached out to them, it's something you should be doing because they are uh, they're a great help. Thank you, Daisy. And now we're gonna go into question and answer time. Andrea Moray is gonna um, answer some of those questions that are posted on the question and answer. Andrea. Actually, Michael, I'm going to be stepping in for Andrea today. She's not feeling well, um, so she's not gonna be able to join us, but I will um, take over this portion for her. Um, so now is the time, you guys, if you have any questions um, for our speakers, any that you heard today, now would be the time. Go ahead and feel free to enter them in the Q&A box or into the chat. And um, now is your opportunity to do that. So we're going to just give you, if you do have any questions, please put them in. And uh, while we wait, I actually have um, a couple of questions for our speakers. Um, this first one is uh, actually for Dawn. Uh, Dawn, regarding your, um, your summer programming, it, it was really interesting to me as someone who used to plan uh, summer meals, especially uh, working with our city and, and parks departments. Um, how did you guys inspire your parks and recs departments to take on that responsibility of being a summer sponsor so that then LAUSD could take the position of being the vendor and invest, you know, like you were mentioning, the benefit of that, uh, taking all the monitoring and everything off of your plate. How did you guys uh, inspire them to, to take that uh, role on, on themselves? Um. Michael, verbally, can I respond? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Um, Robin, actually, it was the city of LA that approached LAUSD. Um, and again, we are not the school food authority for them. They are the program sponsor. They do all their own training. They hire their own staff. We are just 
the vessel of where they purchased our food from us. And it was a natural uh, partnership because the city of LA has such stringent requirements. You know, they have to comply with uh, fair, equitable hiring practices, humane um, treatment of uh, byproducts of the foods that we do eat um, on our strict regulations. So it, it naturally is a really good pro uh, program for them. Uh, they worked with other vendors in the past. I don't know if they had an issue with it or not, but I'm glad that the partnership is working really well. Um, we don't provide them with any training. We don't provide them with any posters. They just assume that responsibility on their own. They ran a program for many, 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 many moons, and we just were a change in the vendor. And it looks like the partnership is working really well. I'm very happy to say that they always comment that the participants say the food's so delicious and it's better than what they've had in past years. We do, I would like to add is uh, provide them with a cold meal and we give them four hot lunches. And that's something they do not get from other um, agencies when they normally get salads or sandwiches or shelf stable kits. And we provide them with a well-rounded variety of different foods that their children can, can enjoy. Um, and then we do pre freeze our milk for about 20 minutes. So by the time it gets there, it's cold. We don't worry about any temperatures. Um, they are monitored by the health department and they don't have issues with the food that we provide to them. That is a great tip to pre-freeze the milk. I, I'm out here from the IE where it gets very, very hot. Um, so all of our, our desert uh, uh, school districts on the call, keep that one in mind. Um, but Thank you so much, Don. Um, my, my hat's off to you definitely for answering that call um, that the Parks and Recs gave to, to come in and serve meals for them. That is fantastic. Um, we have uh, one more question for Daniel. Um, in regards to your uh, food recovery program, uh, when you went to implement this program, did you have any pushback from any um, district employees or other stakeholders when you were trying to implement this program? And if so, how did you overcome it? Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, we did have a little pushback. The um, most most of the time, I really just took explaining to stakeholders what it was that we needed to accomplish. Um, generally, um, when you have these conversations with them, it becomes a lot easier. But it's definitely a challenge, and it's definitely going to be a challenge as we continue. The, there's going to be a lot of pushback, but. You know, I think as long as you explain what the outcome is and the fact that it needs to be a rule, ultimately people will understand and they'll help. But yes, we did have some uh, did have some challenges with that, and we'll continue to because we're still at the beginning of the process here. Thank you, and Daniel, we have one more for you. It just came in the chat. Um, the um, attendees said they really enjoyed the project on food recovery. Um, they wanna know, will schools be mandated to implement some sort of food recovery program in response uh, to SB 1383? Yes, they definitely will be. Um, there will be, we have to make sure that we're sorting trash. It really is a very complicated um, issue. We're going to be separating trash. Some of it will be going to the landfill. Um, and definitely we're going to have to recover the 20% of um, the 20% of edible food, which is, you know, really that seems overwhelming, but um, with the limited, you know, as we're venturing into this, we've really been successful with it. People are going to like that part once they get over the initial pain of implementing these procedures. I can see this being very popular for us. Um, and it's going to solve a problem that's been going on with nutrition for years. Um, the sorting and the hauling and the record keeping that's gonna be much more of a challenge, I think. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, uh, thank you all of our speakers. Um, if anybody does have any other questions, um, you can feel free to throw them in the chat or the Q&A um, and we can always uh, try to circle back to you after the end of the webinar. Um, but with that, we're gonna uh, conclude this portion of the Q&A and I'm gonna pass it back to Mr. Burns. Thank you, Robin, uh, for uh, uh, going through those questions and answers. Okay, now we have our uh, special guest speaker, Matt Upton. If you haven't met Matt, he is the most uplifting and positive gentleman you will ever run into. So he's going <laughs> to inspire us, I'm sure, with some kind of inspirational message. Matt. 
Thank you, Mike. That is so incredible what you said. And to be able to uh, be here with every presenter has been incredible, been just amazing. Just recently, I was able to travel to Guadalajara. And while I was down there, I took a tour to the city of Tequila. And while I was there, I learned something that I think will help each of us. And that was this, at the second tequila distillery that we went to, the tour guide said this to us, that the greatest thing they learned was to embrace the inconsistencies that come with producing this product. And I thought about you and I in the field that we're in, because we know, that inconsistency is the most consistent thing that we have going. The inconsistencies of regular uh, meals and waivers, the inconsistencies of staff and their temperament, the inconsistency of supply chain issues. There's just so many inconsistencies. And for us to really get to the point where we receive the gifts that's embedded inside of inconsistencies, there are five things that we have to really abandon. And I'd like to talk about those right now. Number one, we must abandon the idea that one size fits all. You see, we think that each one of our school restaurants, if we just come up with a policy, if we just come up with a procedure, if we just come up with something that will fit everybody, then we'll solve it yet that actually creates greater frustration. And so we must abandon the idea that one size fits all. And when we do that, when we do that, we'll begin to be able to see that each site has its own solution. Each factor, each part of our mission, each part of our great serve will show us that it has its own solutions inside of there. Number two. We must abandon the concept that our way is the way. Sometimes as the director, sometimes as the assistant director, sometimes as the business owner, we think that our way is the way. And we really got to abandon that idea because it is through abandoning that and embracing that it's somewhere else. And then we will see the options in the variances and the voices of others that will show us the way. Number three, number three, we must abandon the notion that once a challenge is conquered, it will remain conquered. You see, what we do is we think that once I've conquered this, once I've overcome this, once I have taken this situation, this challenge out, it'll never be resurrected. Yet the truth is, it does come back. Once I abandon the idea that once conquered, always conquered, I can embrace, I can embrace scheduled revisits of previous conquerings. Because here's what happens, and we all know this, times change, people change, personnel changes, procedures change policies change. And so we must regularly revisit those previous conquerors and see where we can grow inside of them. And then uh, number four, we must abandon all effort to corral people into one communication and connection method or style. Corralling people is trying to, is the same as trying to herd cats. You can't corral people anymore. There's no such thing as one way communicates and connects to everybody. It is truly multiple ways, multiple ideas. Once we abandon this idea that we can corral everybody into the same communication style or connection method, then we can see areas of connection that we didn't see before because we are previously hidden in our idea that one way will make it work. Number five, we must abandon the concept that normality is achievable, that normality is found in consistency. See, once we abandon this and we, we will notice 
two things, and these are big things, and we all need this because we're exhausted. When we abandon the idea and the concept that that consistency is normality, what will happen is frustrations will go down and fun will go up. And remember this, there are hidden gifts in the midst of inconsistency. And remember, I'm Matt and I'm your CEO, your Chief Encouragement Officer, and you can reach me at 916-708-8103 anytime that you need me. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you, Matt, for that inspiration, for sure. Well, one thing I don't want to abandon is abandon your ship. So I'm going to stay on your ship because all the stuff you talked about is so true. It only opens up Thank your you mind when you can uh, abandon all those thoughts and just open up. Yes. Thank you. So I'm with you, Matt. Thank you. Okay. So let's see here. I think it is closing remarks. That would be me to say thank you, everyone, for attending. I want to thank you, all of our, our guest speakers who've inspired us, shared information, uh, uh, allowed us to allow their time to be here. And I want to thank everybody who's also uh, been here, stayed on for the whole presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. And uh, thank you, Quad uh, County members and um, people that support the Quad County. Thank you very much. Oh, and if everybody's still here, survey, <laughs> fill out the survey.